Do you know what bugs the shit out of me? This is the killer. Reach and not defining it as potential reach and assuming it's actualized reach. It destroys me. It's garbage data. It completely takes common sense and a pulse of culture off the table. It kills me and we talk about it as if it's true. One question, an amazing lineup of CEOs, founders, and experts. This is Marketing for the Now. Attention is the number one asset. Hey Gary, I thought I saw you walk by. I am here. I am here. here. So late, everybody, let me apologize for us. Uh, no, you, you, you don't need me. to apologize because you know what? I was giving well, a shout I'm out. Not, not to you, oh, Andre, because I know we're family and I feel comfortable. I'm talking about Chris S on LinkedIn and Jessica Knight on LinkedIn and Dane Weathers on LinkedIn and Cody Weaver on LinkedIn. So um, I just needed to apologize to them. Excellent. Well, I'm going to just let you guys riff because Diana has a lot to share and uh, we can't wait to hear it. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Diana. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am yeah. well. I am well. It's nice. I've seen you three times now in the last like six weeks. This is exciting. I know. I know. And you know, we have a call later oh, today too. <laughs> Amazing. So, actually, so let's go right into it. Like knowing your background, um, being fond of your work, feel that you actually have, you know, for everybody who's watching, I do feel like the more senior you get in these big corporations, it becomes more challenging. I don't razz, I'm empathetic. It gets harder to be closer to the pulse, to the street. Um, but I think you've done a really nice job watching you from afar. And so to answer this question directly, like what do you think on this brand performance? Like how do people balance brand building and performance from your perspective? Yeah, I think, you know, not to be contrarian, I just have a different viewpoint on it. And I actually don't think these things are two separate things. I don't either. I, I, how I approach. I, as a fact, when I heard you at the CMO summit and like no, notice balancing, like I believe balancing is, could be looked at two different ways to your point, opposites or actually the purple. The exit, huh? So they complement each other. And if you really think about it and what we try to do with the brands that I work on, the team that I have at Colgate Pomodoro, like I have the privilege of leading what we call the consumer experience and growth team, which means nothing to anyone. But really what we've done is rethought about what marketing for the future for now in this complex consumer driven environment really means. And so we put the consumer at the center of everything. So what does that mean? So my team has revenue growth management, insights, data and advanced analytics, but also some of those traditional um, CMO elements that you would think of when it comes to digital commerce or brand building or creative or social or um, just traditional media. And the reason why we did that is, is a consumer experience is just not about brand love. It's not about, you know, actually experiencing the product. Uh, it's not just about seeing an ad that you fall in love with. It really is the entire touch point. So from when I get the product to the zero moment of truth and I'm in the consideration all the way to the second moment of truth where I actually experience the product, which is really where you drive and build brands, um, all of those touch points matter. And how we make that experience more exceptional and what are the jobs to be done so that we really build the brand. You know, at Colgate, we have brands that are 217 year old, like Colgate Toothbrush, which you all know and love and are having your shelves. But we also have newer brands like Hello, which is yeah. a very design forward brand, countertop friendly, but really thinks about the consumer experience at every single touch point. So a long way of saying, Every, every touch point in marketing is performance driving. Every touch point in marketing should be brand building. And if you don't think about it that way, then you're not thinking from a human or a consumer lens. Why, explain to all the people that are watching, because what normally happens is like, I'm looking at the chat right now. We're doing this on LinkedIn exclusively today. This is obviously gonna be on my podcast. We're gonna cut this up and chop this up and put it everywhere. <laughs> Explain, you know, obviously the corporate people are gonna understand this, but go down into the trenches of the audience I'm seeing here. Explain to people why corporations, because your statement makes so much sense. I came from small business and startup land. Why in big market organizations, the Fortune 500s, why, why are they not consumer centric? Why are they academia centric or corporate centric? think the large, so my sweet spot is a 100, 200 year old company. That's my, that's where I come into play. And I don't think that they're not consumer centric. I think it's an end. They're consumer centric, but when you're a big ship and you've been around that long to be able to be around for another 200 years, 
you have to make sure that you're, you know, from a finance standpoint, that you have smart accounting principles, that legal is your best friend. When you're a larger brand, you become a legal target. So all of those things create another lever. I think it's how you think and approach them. So my best friends at work, my head of legal, my CFO, HR as well, too, because you can't get the right talent for your roles without that. And I think right now, a lot of folks approach them, especially in marketing teams, as, oh, we got to get around legal or, oh, you know, we got to try to convince the CFO that this is a good idea rather than bringing them along for the journey. So at the end of the day, what does the CFO want? What do even I want? I want to get my bonus. Um, we want to deliver um, a profit back to, um, you know, our investor community. Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, we create these brand experiences. So really being able to link and connect the two uh, is important and understanding the flexibility that we need in a P&L to, to be able to move at the speed of culture. You just have to bring your CFO folks along. And then legal plays such a critical role, especially in a social environment, wanting to be in the moment of culture, uh, working with your legal partner so you can do it in a, in a way that actually protects your brands and allows you to do things that are appropriate and don't open you up uh, for litigation. So it's not that they're not brand obsessed. It's that the bigger you get, you know, they say more money, more problems. The bigger you get, the more that you have to be thoughtful about maintaining a position. And I would say the last thing that is really critical for larger companies that they have to work on, when you have a large company, it's just like being in a big family. You have workers in the factory, you have workers across multiple markets, and you want to make sure that you don't make decisions that risk their livelihood as well, too. The stakes are higher. Of course. So that's really what's driving some of the extra layers that you have to maneuver through when you're in a bigger corporation. The thing that I'm curious about from your perspective is the extra layers lead to less speed, right? Watered down. Those, those were not as big of an issue in a, small, in a slower world. Yes. When your competitors were also spending six months to put out a commercial, you know, that's one thing. But obviously, for example, Colgate, we all know it, we all love it. Like in there's been a lot of innovation yeah. in your space. And those smaller entrepreneurs with the you know, the advantages of being able to be in retail or have the money to do media have changed a lot in a world where Shopify can represent a Shopify store can represent the ability to reach consumers the way being in all the Walmarts used to, or that social can now represent what commercials did. What what are, you know, knowing that you in that sweet spot have been around 200 year old companies, what do you think the best big companies, what's the best behaviors that you've seen from big companies to actually get good at um, the nimbleness needed to be great at building brand and getting performance? I, t I tell this to my son and it's the same thing I approach business with. You can't be a me too. You can't go after, hey, the small guys do it this way. No, you've got to own your own space. So we are typically in most categories, we in there incumbent. We do have smaller, um, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, disruptor brands that we're also building. But if you, it, but specifically focus on those incumbent brands, leverage the scale. Those smaller brands, they would love the brand loyalty, the scale, the fact that you know Colgate itself is the number one household penetrating brand in the planet. Like that's not a low key brag that those are just facts. And that's so great. to have that brand love to play with. So yes, can they move with speed in certain areas that I cannot, that is true. But what I have to work with from an already emotional connection with my consumer, um, advocacy and um, consumer love that, you know, when I have a brand like Fabuloso, before I can even put something on social, we had people dress up like Fabuloso for Halloween this year and send that to us. So there are intangible things that we have that are different and you got to play to your strengths and your skill set. And if you try to focus on, hey, I need to operate like, you know, the startup brands, then you just look like the old dude in the club. Like you really have to think about, okay, what is ownable for my brand? Where should I play? And then how, as the bigger brand, do I help grow the category itself? And I think if you understand your responsibilities as the larger incumbent brand and you play them well, I, I will tell you there's a lot of space in these categories. Consumers love choice and you enable them to make the choice that is right for them. I think the other thing that large brands have, and especially that we have at Colgate, is the efficacy of the, our product delivering at the end of the game. The, the yeah, end of, the of course. Game. And knowing that the biggest way to build brands is to have an incredible brand experience 
And to have that be science backed the way it is by us, knowing that every time the consumer is going to get that experience that they're looking for, that's that's when you really win or lose. So it's how you place those bets and investments. But no, I'm not going to be able to see something relevant in the culture and then post something five minutes later. But what we were able to do with the Met Gala, when we saw that the carpet looked like, you know, Colgate toothpaste, we were able to get something up and out the door in an hour, which is a, a small More than fast enough. Co- yeah. a company that, you know, we play with. I love you. I hope you have a great day. Great end of the year. Have a good Thanksgiving. Thanks for coming on. Fantastic. We've got a new friend up next, Gary. We've got Janelle Tavis, who runs Bugaboo, which is one of my favorite brands uh, in North America. And I didn't realize it's a Dutch-based yeah. brand. Mm-hmm. She's gonna, yeah, she's going to lay it down for us. Give us a little, some global insights as well. Welcome, Janelle. Amazing. Thank you for having me. This is actually our first time meeting Gary. So it's such a treat to be here. Thank you. I, uh, thank you. I, uh, I, uh, know the brand very well, so I'm pretty pumped you're here. Why don't you tell the people that might not be in that life cycle about the brand for a minute or two, and then we'll get the jam, but thank you for being here. Yeah. Amazing. So I'll set the stage a little bit for sure. Before I came to Bugaboo, I actually spent nearly a decade at Nike. And I think whether you sell strollers or you sell sneakers, it was really interesting to hear you and Diana. But I think what the great brands actually really do is put the consumer at the center. And what we do at Bugaboo, that consumer is the new parent. So Bugaboo is a parenting solutions brand. And as you said, we're best known for our high performance and innovation strollers and uh, European founded. So our, our design team and our innovation team actually sit out of the Netherlands. And I look after the, the US and Canadian business. So it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. For the people that like drive yes. luxury cars or, you know, like it is it is the Rolls Royce of, of strollers um, and being a New York City parent, you need a really strong machine. And so I'm yes. a, um, talk to me about this. I'm actually genuinely curious. Mm-hmm. Um, about, because I think Diana's right about like performance of brand shouldn't be separate. It's more of the gray of the black and white, but most marketing organizations are structured with it being like brand over here, performance over here. How do y'all think about it? And what's your current state of the union on what you feel inside about the challenges or the opportunities in performance, the challenges and the opportunities in doing bigger brand work that creates affinity? And how do you think about this juxtaposition? Yeah, such a good question. So again, I want to I want to pull us back um, because I think the first thing that any any great brand should do and what I would offer to the room of CEOs and founders and executives watching this today is really just to first start off with putting your consumer in the center and understanding where's your consumer coming from? How are they finding you? And then also most importantly, where are the gaps? And then you can decide then whether or not you want to spend that dollar on a brand awareness building campaign or a performance campaign. So again, just to to give you an actual example of how we see it at Bugaboo, as as I mentioned before in the setup, Bugaboo is a, a Dutch design company on the other side of the pond in Europe, really strong brand awareness, deep roots. But then when you come over here to the US, right, we're, we're actually seeing really incredible growth the last three years. But when we pulled a room of 100 expecting parents, I mean, I'm so happy that you're familiar with the brand because it was actually single digit awareness. You think, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You know, on the awareness front, cor- correct me if I'm wrong, it is a premium product, yes? 100%, yes. It's a premium product that any parent can tell you. I mean, I'm also a New York, a New York mom, that you can really tell the difference oh. in when you're pushing down, you know, the streets of the Upper West Side and it's pouring rain and you got to get to Zay bars and fill the the (laughs) undersea basket with groceries. I mean, you need a performance ride. And even if you're not a New York parent, if you are, you live in suburbia, you're going to want a stroller that folds really easy and you can throw in the back of the way, By the way, that that little rant you had about Upper East Side Zay bars rain, you need to clip that and you need to run that on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook against New York City mom demo. Like that little clip right there, I think would be one of your top performance, brand performance. Okay. Ads. Taking taking notes and all they need to do is just follow me in the day in the life of like trying to get my three-year-old and and and, and ingredients and dinner on the table. So, but that's, ex- that's exactly it. So to go back to your question, what is, what is that tension? I think it just for, it, it comes down to 
What is your consumer experiencing? How do you create emotional storytelling and high quality content that resonates with the, the problem that your consumer is wrestling with? And therefore, as a brand, the solution that you're offering, and then you put dollars behind it in the spaces that you know that your consumer is the most. So for example, at Bugaboo, we know that late 20 something year old, early 30s, all the way up until now mid 40s, starting to become first time parents, they're spending a lot of time on social media. I know I don't need to tell you this. So that is really where we want to show up in that part of the consumer journey where they're researching or they're wondering, hey, what is everyone talking about? What is everyone wearing? The Facebook groups are just like such a, a wealth of information for that expectant parent that really doesn't know what to do in this new chapter of their life. So I think, you know, just to kind of summarize it, it's one, it's putting the consumer at the center. Can I, jump in, can I jump in here? Yeah. One thing we're obsessed at at VaynerX land that we don't see people doing in the broader marketing world is consumer at the center. Mm -hmm. To your point, 27 year old, Upper West Side, first time mom, young by New York standards, coming from a third generation wealthy family versus 41 year old, first time mom, Upper East Side, coming from the streets and her husband or her wife have made it. Mm -hmm. already immediately have a very different psychographic yeah. reality. Yeah. How, you know, do you find it challenging, like every other brand I speak to every day for the last decade, and especially last three years, of not being able to make enough creative at a good enough cost to be able to be relevant to as many different, consumer at the center, in my mind, for a brand, even at the size of Bugaboo, which is not, Nike yeah. or Colgate, but still a big brand. Yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60 different specific consumer segmentations to make up the customer. But creative is so expensive mm -hmm. when you work with agencies or even internally. Is when you think about consumer at the center, do you try to generalize it in one lump or are you thinking in this cohort consumer segmentation model? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I think. The short answer is, is that as a brand, if you talk to everybody, you're, you're actually talking to nobody. So you really have to be specific about who is our consumer muse, everything from their age demographic to the, to the other brands that they like, where do they live? Where do they shop? What are they looking for? So when we are creating content, yes, you create a profile of, of the consumer that you're speaking to, and that may resonate outside of that, but then you're making sure that you're being really focused. So at, again, at Bugaboo, this is the new parent. At Nike, it's the athlete. It's it's the, it's the kid who's who's trying to start their first run or starting their first basketball but, but game. The, the, new, the, new, the thing I'm fascinated by, the challenge that I perceive you may have and others that are similar, the new parent comes in so many shapes and sizes. Yeah. But what we're actually finding is that whether to, to paint that picture, if they're the 27 year old Upper West Side parent or they are 40 something and they, and they live in Oklahoma, actually their drivers are the same. Yeah, and, but to stop them. Yeah, to stop on, them scrolling. To stop them on relevance to create the consumption of those tried and true is the thing I'm fascinated by. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Most humans, when you bleed them down, have the similar 10 things. My concern and obsession is getting permission for them to listen requires relevance. And that's where it gets real different of what they need to see and hear. Yeah. And we, we struggle with the same thing. How do you stop the scroll? Yeah. And, 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 and stopping the scroll, as you, as you probably agree, is not just, even though we know it's the dominant force now, that still is TV, that still is a billboard, that still is, like, it's still all of it. Stop the scroll is like a omni battle right yeah i gotta say though whatever your content is i'm always stopping my scroll because i you're think you're sweet. Sweet. Amazing. Hey, let's let's definitely connect now that i know you're in new york i'll ask andrea, andrea to set us up 100 percent would love that thank you for having me Gary. i want to give you one more second because i jumped in there a lot because i was yeah. fascinated by that what did we not touch on that you might have wanted to touch on or let people know uh, let's see if I think I would like to just I mean, let's just summarize all the great points that we talked about and leave your listeners with some takeaways. So um, I think all great brands, they, they actually do understand their consumer really well. Start with the insights. Start start with a deep understanding of your consumer mindset. Focus on emotional storytelling. Connect your products into your consumer. And the last thing that I'll say um, is make sure that you're all scoring off the same scorecard because make sure that you have the same version of success on what you're trying to do because as a marketer, 
you want to make sure that you align with finance, with sales on what that campaign target is, and just make sure that you have a singular metric of success in order to be successful. Love it. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Janelle. All right, Gary, we have another new friend coming up, Kate Lamberton. You might remember that Jim Stangle and Kate did, they authored this incredible article in Harvard Business Review that was all about brand formats. So we've got her here today to lay down all the insights and findings. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm well. I'm super aware, and so I'm going to let you take the floor. You wrote the manifesto. <laughs> why don't you? Why don't you give everybody a, a, a little bit of your thesis observations, the things you're seeing? Yeah, it's been really interesting to listen to your prior guests because I think we're all on the same page mm -hmm. uh, from from the very opening where there is no division here to we need a metric that puts us on the same scorecard. Exactly amazing. These people are brilliant and they're doing it in the real world. Um, it was really interesting because I was working I, a few years ago. I teach, among other things, I teach intro to marketing to Wharton, you know, a thousand Wharton undergrads a year. And I have this class on brand measurement. How are the kids today in marketing? Like, like just for two seconds, because this is fascinating to me, are they overly pot committed to social and not thinking 360? Do they go into the academic environment, maybe over indexing on over respecting some of yesterday, even though they're living differently as consumers, something in between, everyone's different. What's the vibe? You know, I think what's great about them is that they will ask questions about all of it. I mean, they're going to interrogate any claim you put in front of them. Yeah, that's and, and thank God, right? Because 100%. we've had a couple years of just honestly investment in vapor, right? Oh, oh this is the I hot thing, that's the hot thing. And so what they actually want are frameworks to think through the things because the things are going to change. They're going to keep changing. And so it's not helpful to have a class on TikTok. What's helpful is to have a class on how media works and how exposure and reach affect behavior. Then whatever the new thing is, they can analyze it. Do they, is there gonna, one more thing before I let you go? Of course, I completely went against what I said. <laughs> but, I, but I've got you here and I got to ask. Reach. Do you know what bugs the shit out of me? <laughs> Tell me something. I'm sure there are a couple things. Okay. There are a couple things, but this is the killer. Reach and not defining it as potential reach and assuming it's actualized reach yeah. destroys me. Okay, It destroys me. It, it's garbage data in a lot it's, of cases. It's, 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 not it's devastating. It completely yeah. takes common sense and a pulse of culture off the goddamn table. It kills yep. me. And we talk about it as if it's true. And, and, and this is the kind of thing that I think performance marketers get focused on because they're given a dashboard and they're supposed to hit these numbers and it's not a meaningful number, it's just a number. And once you have a number, then you chase it. Um, and I think this actually takes us back to this question of brand, right? Because what that reach means in the context of a strong or ascending brand is completely different than what it means when your brand is, is, in, is in garbage world, right? And so, you know, when we when we talk about this stuff in research, it's an interaction. The effect of X on Y depends on Z, right? So the effect of reach on any out, any given outcome is going to depend on about five different things, maybe fifty different things, in fact. So on its own, it's it's not a meaningful metric, um, but it's it's what gets used to sell a lot. Um, and but again, that's what I love about these students. They will interrogate, they will push, they will chase, and I think that's a hopeful sign. Great. All right, go back to the manifesto. What do we okay, say? okay. So manifesto. So so uh, I'm looking for brand measurements, and most of the brand measurements I'm finding, I'm like, eh, mm, how is that managerially useful? Like that's fine. You can give me a brand ranking. I don't know what to do with it, right? And again, these students are going to push me if if I give them something like that. So uh, you know, sixty percent of my class is finance majors, and they're like, what is it? How do how do I put that on? I'm glad that Interbrand can tell me a value and put it on an asset sheet, but how do I then talk to anybody about it? And so I ran across this company um, that does what I think is actually, I don't want to plug, but they, I thought they were doing smarter things. Yeah, they do smarter things. What is it? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. It's called Bera, B-E-R-A, um, with brand measurement and tracking and connecting brand measurement to the, the measurement of brand equity to both upstream, like upstairs consequences, like things the CFO cares about um, and what's happening on the performance side and what's happening on the brand side. And in talking to them, what became apparent was that if you don't have this bridging metric that connects performance to brand, you actually, everybody loses. 
um, because brand has an effect on the finance relevant KPIs through its enhancement of best case, what's happening in performance. Performance, if it's being done well, will directly amplify the effect that brand has. The two of them then come into this metric and actually both of them can be accountable and both of them can have short and long-term effects that can be captured over time. Right now, what happens is people say performance is short-term and it can be held accountable. Brand is long-term and we just have to wait. Actually not. Actually, both can be accountable. And that's good news because both keep their piece of budget. But you need this bridging brand, this brand equity metric or it's not really possible. I totally, I, to, I couldn't, I talk about it as purple, right? I'm writing uh, a new book and the cover is purple because the thesis is if using the political structure in the US, which is very mm -hmm. contentious, if the, <laughs> the world of marketing is red or blue, the magic's in the purple. Yeah, I mean, and it's also, it's also though, I think still understanding the distinctions, right? I wouldn't wanna lose the red and the blue because they do different things, right? And so so you have this, this metric. And so there's, they break it into familiarity, regard, meaning, and uniqueness. And what's nice there is if you capture this and you see, for example, in an older brand, say you're talking about one of these brilliant 200 year old brands, familiarity is easy. Regardless, they have plenty, they have plenty as, as ages, you got to build uniqueness, right? So then what you can say is, here's what performance, when we do this performance action, here's how uniqueness is changing. And this is the part of the brand we need to work on. So we need to select the performance that we can show a relationship to uniqueness because that's where our brand is right now. Before I lose you, why do you think so many people in, in modern agencies and brands struggle with relevance at scale? Oh, because it's it's almost it's very very hard. I mean, it's incredibly hard. But I think it, what the 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 trick, and I'm not going to say there's an easy answer because there's not for any of this stuff, or we don't have a job. But it's picking the the level at which the segmentation operates. Um, for me, what is often underappreciated is that the segmentation criteria that matters the most is the information processing style that's in play at any moment. So when you guys were talking about the Upper East Side, Upper West Side mom. Yes, of course. If you're trying to go to, I want to give you an image that specifically resonates with you. Yeah, that's that's tricky. You got to use some behavioral data to match that up. But if what you can say is both of these moms are when they're wrestling with their bugaboo, um, emotionally stressed, under time pressure, et cetera, et cetera, you know a general class of of creative that's going to yes. work for them. It's going to be quick hit, simple message. You know, you know what? I, you know you what know. I love. Yep. You know what I love about what you said. I think one of the reasons we were able to excel past the market in social is that is the same philosophy we deploy against the different social networks because we know the people right now that are consuming something on LinkedIn versus if they were on lunch, in their office LinkedIn versus on lunch TikTok yes. is a different version of themselves. Yes, exactly. And that's actually what matters. I mean, I can tell you, and I say this all the time, Amazon has no idea who I am because although I have no children, I've thrown probably a dozen baby showers because I throw right. a great baby shower. Right. I don't want babies, but I throw a great baby shower. It is so confused about what I am. I get garbage about, not garbage, I get, I get, Marketing stuff that's, no, stuff that's yeah, stuff you know? that's garbage. To, to your point, to me, right? If I get if I get New York Giants, if I get New York Giants stuff, that's garbage to me. Because, <laughs> because, because I'm a Jets fan, you know. So. But but if they understand that I want something funny when I'm scrolling through TikTok, even if it's baby stuff, I might pay attention because I'm drawn to funny in that moment. Yep. But if I'm looking for toothpaste and I'm in an analytical thinking mode, it doesn't matter whether I'm 60 or I'm 20. That's when you can deliver the efficacy stats. So yep. what we have to understand is how people are processing at different moments and make that match. And this is, I do a lot of this in consulting. This is what we do. We analyze the whole journey for processing style. And then you can do something that allows you to tailor at scale. Um, but you know, you have to you have to let go of some assumptions and you have to kind of back up from some of the really charming and rich work that gets way down into the details um, because it can limit your ability to scale and it can be so wrong. It can eliminate your ability to scale if the cost of the creative and the hours deployed against it aren't for a meaning enough scale to actually impact your business. Yep, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Great talking to you. That was fantastic. Thank you, Gary. Soon. Take it All away. Right. Next up, we've got one of my favorites, Kaylin McNamara in the house. 
She's our chief business officer. Hi, Kaylin. Hey. A little sunny behind me. <laughs> I know it's good. You got the angelic view. We could use a little sunshine in a 30 degree uh, northeastern weather weather pattern, I think. We're going to bring on some heat. We got some heat coming next with Mandy Rossi. She's the CMO of Michael's. So nice to see you. Hi. Mandy, I can't believe you guys have 1,300 stores and you're running all the e-commerce as well. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. I think Michael's is sometimes bigger than people think. Um, yeah. 1,300 stores almost. Well, I can't wait to listen to this one. So I'm going to let you guys take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Andrea. Hi there. We'll get right into it. Um, just knowing your career, most recently in retail, but also CPG analytics companies, I'd imagine this concept of brand performance is not a new one for you in terms of how do you balance sort of brand building with sort of the demand generation that's required at any company. But obviously the landscape has also changed dramatically, even probably in between the two last gigs you've even had. Yeah. would love to hear about kind of what have been some of the unlocks for you and where have you found success in following brand and performance activities, whether it's in your current role or even in previous gigs as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, a, a lot of it has been said, uh, very well <laughs> said by those who, who came before me. Um, so much is about the consumer, right? To go back to what Janelle said as well, um, and understanding your, your consumer, where they are in a journey, where they are in that moment in time, but then also your brand. So I'll use Michael's as an example. We are a promotional brand. So promotions and performance is part of the DNA of our brand. And it's what customers expect from us. Our category is also very high low. So that's different than like when I was at P&G working on like Tide or Pampers, it manifests in, in a little bit of a different way, just based on what the DNA of the brand is. Um, but I always tell my team, which others have said this as well, like everything has to be on brand and everything has to perform. It's just about getting clear on what the KPI is that you're optimizing towards. So for Michael's, like right now we're going into our holiday season, um, which is probably not surprising. So it, it's a, and actually a little bit of what Kate just said. It's knowing when do I want to lead. So Pinterest would be a great example. People are there for inspiration. We know our customer is very maximalist when it comes to the holiday season. So we want to lead there with the beautiful Christmas tree and the room that's decked out and maybe a thing of like you could click here and see how to make this project. Um, and all this stuff may be on sale when they click through and they will see that. But we've seen even in A-B testing, leading with the price point in Pinterest doesn't work because that's not what mm -hmm. the audience is there for. Whereas like in Meta, actually it works a lot more like a promotional ad and leading with all trees are up to 60% off this week and you can get a rewards bonus, you know, if you buy between these dates is going to work a little bit better. And then the tree is still beautiful in the background, but, but it's a little bit of, we have the DNA of our brand, which is both inspirational, if you want to call that the brand stuff, and very promotionally driven. We're in retail. And, and it's a little bit of just knowing like which one is going to lead in which moments and how do we get that balance right for where our customer is today, which right now, um, I'm sure there may be others in retail out there. It's a really challenging moment. Yeah. Uh, and we are in a very discretionary category. So, yeah. you know, if we talk to our customers about one, people love doing creative projects. So it's a we're in a fun space because Michael's is a happy place for a customer to go. Their main barrier right now is like, yeah, I want to do all that stuff, but I don't have the, the free cash to do it. So they need the discounts. They need the rewards offers, things like that to help get over what their main sort of trial or purchase barrier is right now. Maybe yeah. other times it's the know how to do it. So it's, it's kind of knowing who we're talking to and sort of where their mindset is and what that context is. And, and just playing with the dials. Yeah, the contextual relevance of the distribution of those messages is what really what kind of the, the strategy is kind of in a modern world. Speaking of contextual relevance of brand, as a loyal uh, customer myself, I've noticed the glow up recently. Um, with the 50th anniversary, I know that the brand has undergone uh, kind of an evolution of the identity. You have a new tagline around kind of everything to create anything. Tell us about the impetus of this refresh and this evolution and how you see it uh, playing into the long-term growth strategy for the brand. Yeah. So a few things. Um, yes, we turned 50 this month, which is very exciting. Um, He's the new 30, by the way. <laughs> yes. Good. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that on a personal basis as well. Um, you know, what Michaels has been on a transformation journey. I joined the brand about a year and a half ago and kind of in that same time frame, the business has transformed. So we obviously throughout COVID, 
there was a, a big boom in arts and crafts as people were doing more creative projects when they were at home. Um, but obviously there was a lot of e-com transformation that went along with that. So um, even just in the last year, we've replatformed our site. We've launched our, our third party marketplace business. We just launched our maker place business. Um, it actually came out of beta earlier this week, which is our handmade marketplace. We're opening new small format stores. Um, we launched a credit card. We relaunched our rewards program. So there had been a lot of real transformation around the customer experience of Michael's as a whole. And um, the brand had not really evolved to tell that story. And even just where the consumer mindset was, our, our prior branding had been done at the end of 2019. Um, and really carried through COVID, um, which was not a promotional time for all, all the reasons many of us know at this point in time due to supply chain and other things. Um, so it worked really well for the big inspirational storytelling. It was very influencer centric, um, but the promotionality actually had gotten lost as well. So we, we were sort of coming out of that COVID time frame with a, a business that had transformed. So it was time to look at the branding as well. And one of the big things very relevant to the brand formants conversation is we need to show up as one brand. And as promos had sort of started to come back late 21 into 22, Michael's had evolved to, to there was like beautiful brand campaign stuff that would run. And then all the promotional work literally looked like a different brand, mm. looked very promotional. And it was like, these two things don't quite fit. So we needed to sort of take a step back and say, look, we are here to serve all creative people now across this sort of broader playing field that Michael's um, now has in front of us. And we need it all to feel cohesive. And so some of it was, um, yes, there's like the, the bigger brand messages. Our campaign is all about helping people go from ideas to I did it. Um, but even like having a design system that works really hard and can flex up and down was one of the biggest things we needed. And now especially fast forward to more AI driven content automation, having a design system that is flexible, but tight yep. also helps to drive that consistency as we pump out a lot more content, some of which a human creates and some of which might get put together in other ways. Love it. I'd love to click down more into Maker Place because I know that that was new news officially sort of yeah. this would love to hear more. I think what's amazing about sort of the platform is it feels very from the community um, and it feels very informed by what seems like a kind of a lot of listening you've done as an organization. So would love to understand a little bit of sort of what led to the launch of that platform and where do you see that kind of playing in the in the long term strategy as well? Yeah. So first, thank you for saying that we have worked very hard to have Maker Place really be a place that is all about celebrating all things handmade. So it is our handmade marketplace. You will, you know, our aspiration is you're only going to find handmade stuff there. So it's not drop ship items. We sell a lot of that stuff on the Michael side, but this is really for people, one, who are our Michael's customers. We know there are a lot of them who are sellers um, who maybe go to craft fairs or they were selling previously on Etsy. Um, and we wanted to give them a solution within the Michael's ecosystem to do that. And we did spend a lot of time with them to understand really what their aspirations are. We want to help them grow their business. We are doing it with significantly lower fees than the other available options, no listing fees, um, to hopefully make this a very maker-friendly site where we can support um, our customers in growing their businesses. Uh, we heard from the makers that um, three quarters of them said they, they felt like there was a lot of um, need for a better solution in this space. And then we worked with them to really design around that. At the same time, we know our creative customers on the Michael side also love to buy handmade goods. Uh, so this allows us to sort of meet both the seller and buyer piece together um, and, and hopefully offer some really unique and handcrafted things. Um, really, that does create a community. We also offer classes and how to's. So if you're someone who's maybe you see a beautiful crocheted thing and you think that's so cool, that maker might actually offer a class so you can learn how to do some of that yourself. Um, and then it's nice for the makers because we give them more ways to earn. So it's not just making the goods you sell, but you can teach a class. And if you fill it up, you're gonna make more money or you have how to, um, you know, sort of affiliate lists. So if you do a class and then you go and buy things from that list from Michael's, then they actually get some reward on that as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're excited. Literally came out of beta like a day ago. So it, it's still very early days, but um, we've gotten lots of, of great feedback. Uh, we already have over 10,000 stores and you know, we're like a day. And obviously in beta, 
we had signed some people up mainly through word of mouth. Um, so we're really excited to see where it goes. I'm excited. With Halloween behind us, it's officially Christmas in my family. So <laughs> I'm headed into awesome. hosting and gifting <laughs> mindset. So I'm excited to check it out. Um, but appreciate the time. I know we're at time, but thank you so much. It's so exciting to see all the momentum and appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye. you guys. That was fantastic. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Christina. We've got some exciting news. Um, her 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 name is going to come up as as something that she's not because she just got married. So we yeah. like to call Christina X around here, and that's never going to change. Never. No, some, no, su no. some superpowers. Um, but Christina is no longer Blankenship. She is now Marseika. Yes, I know. I need a hard launch strategy. Yeah, exactly. It's it. happening yeah. today. New brand, <laughs> new brand refresh. Excellent. Well, we're really excited to bring Jason Brock um, up for a dialogue around all of his fantastic work, um, specifically in performance and how he drives that for St. Jude, which is a phenomenal organization. Um, we've had the luxury of working with Jason for quite some time. So thank you so much for joining today and looking forward to this conversation, you guys. Thanks for having me and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Right. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Hard launch the name next marketing for the now. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've known you for a few years. It's such an honor to work with you guys. We'll get a chance to talk about the mission and all the amazing things you guys are up to. I would love if you could just start with a little bit of context on your background as a performance marketer mm -hmm. and just give us a sense for what you're up to at St. Jude. Well, I kind of consider this my third leg of my career, if you will. In my early days, I was in financial services, the early days of online banking. So really started from a digital product perspective. Mm -hmm. And there's where I kind of developed a passion for product, user experience, and consumer behavior. And then I made a pretty big leap. I made a leap into the marketing agency world. What began as a small digital startup just grew to be part of one of the large holding companies. And we focused on performance media and analytics for Fortune 1000 organizations. And that's a season where we have the shared passion of love and for numbers really grew, right? We talk about numbers a lot. Yeah. Uh, so love doing that, love solving big problems for clients. But honestly, there was something that was still missing for me. I love the work, love the clients, but was really craving a more tangible way to connect my day to day with a bigger purpose. And that journey led me here. It led me here to the Fundraising Awareness Organization for St. Jude. And this mission has just been incredible huge global impact and allows me to just leverage that love of data and media and apply it to something much bigger. Yeah, I mean, um, even being in an agency, it's like the highlight of my career, getting to apply what we do to such an amazing cause. Um, we don't usually get that honor on this scale too. Um, but St. Jude is such an incredible example of brand formance because the entire objective of marketing is raising donations. It's very DR focused in a sense, but you could really argue that that TV strategy that you guys have had for many years and are really famous for um, these two minute spots, explaining patient stories and capturing really the impact while still collecting donations with phone number, QR code, that was brand formance all along for all these years. So you guys being a pioneer in brand formance digitally isn't all that surprising, but I would love to hear how you guys have um, changed that approach and what that looks like for you now. Yeah, that, that fundraising you mentioned, it's an awesome resp oh, responsibility. The reality is it takes over $2 billion a year to fund the operations of St. Jude and the science and research and patient care there. So, yeah, started with, I'd say, those DRTV two-minute spots you mentioned, but also direct mail and radiothons. Those are early examples of brand formants for us. So yeah. we know that consumer behavior changes have evolved over time, but the foundation still holds true. Um, when I think pre-pandemic, I also think about YouTube. We were early adopters of YouTube's action-based campaigns. And that's really where we started to move the needle from thinking about YouTube as a performance driver and not just a brand building platform. So mm -hmm. for over two years, our top ad on YouTube, take a guess how long it was. Take a guess. 15 seconds. Five minutes and 13 seconds. Right. So yes. powerful content always wins. Now, yeah. We're in the era of TikTok vacation of everything, right? As we think about attention span. So the speed of content consumption, overwhelming challenge of audience attention. So maybe we should jump into TikTok and kind of some of our brand formats like there. Yeah. I mean, you guys are experts in that space and we've learned just as much from your team about how to do brand formats on TikTok as I hope we've been able to help you guys with, but um, would love to hear what it's unlocked for you. Cause I know at an organization that's, um, really, really 
focused on making sure that that bottom line stays consistent every year. Being innovative in a platform like TikTok probably took a lot. So would love to hear a little bit more about the effort behind the scenes to get to that point and all the things that it has unlocked for you now that you have a really well-oiled machine. Well, I'd say em embracing brand performance was honestly out of necessity, right? Most of us marketers, we've heard the phrase, don't make ads, make TikToks. Well, the data plays that out. Um, but really the most surprising thing for me on that platform was how fast the creative fatigues, right? With a platform yeah. like TikTok, it moves at the speed of culture. So you practically can't have a sit it and forget it model. So mm -hmm. for us, that meant we had to have fresh organic content and we had to constantly take that organic content that had traction and we had to spark it. And it was out of necessity as much as anything. Yeah, but it also probably was an enormous shift, not only in the performance marketing side, what you needed to facilitate, but on the creative side and the amount of output that you needed to generate. And then um, probably the level of collaboration that you have with your brand counterparts and performance. Yeah. As brand performance came together, how did you guys as an organization bring together brand and performance? Yeah, I think for a lot of marketing organizations, they set up brand and performance almost as a competing system. And we know that can't be the case. I think for us, there's there's really three important things we did. The first thing we actually do is for every employee, they have an annual brand goal, every employee. So brand health is paramount in all we do. It stays in our DNA. And then operationally, we brought brand advertising and performance media together. One team optimized under a single media mix. So that makes ease of optimization in terms of budgets and allocation. So depending on audience attention or donation intent, we can easily move. And then the last thing I'd say, and this is the hardest one maybe for all of us, is what I call our 180 degree effect. Many marketers start with a creative approach. Then how do we push that across every media channel and market and then report on which audiences respond? We got to flip that to be audience led. We got to start with what are the audiences in mind? OK, where are those audiences? Let's understand where they are and then produce contextually relevant content based on that audience and that platform. And it's easy to say that it's hard to operationalize that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have a phrase here, modern comms planning. And I don't know what you guys call it, but it is truly flipping the entire model on its head. And once you see it, you really can't unsee it, right? And right. I'm sure it took a while for everybody at St. Jude to see it. Um, how did you really spend your time building that foundation for everybody? Well, I think it's it's a journey, right? It, we're, we're not complete in that. I think a lot of it is uh, incrementality testing is important. I mm -hmm. think as marketers, we also talk a lot about demand creation versus demand capture. Mm -hmm. And we think about how do you balance that, which implies 50-50. The reality is it's not 50-50 depending on the marketplace and your business objectives. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of direct consumer brands focus on. I think, uh -huh. yeah, look, we, we managed to clone him in different forms, I think. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, if I can just round out with one quick thing, we got to put brand formants in action here. And so if anybody heard the message, appreciated it, um, felt resonance with the mission of St. Jude, would really appreciate any donations. You can go to stjude.org. Um, it's Q4. Every single dollar counts. And as Jason said, every single um, aspect of the organization runs based off donations from marketing department, to patient care. No family or child ever faces a bill because of the humanity of people like who are on this call. So any amount um, really helps and would appreciate any donations. I think Jason would be proud of you, Christina, for that one. Always selling. Yeah, we love the work is so important that they do. And it's, yes. um, yeah, it's such an honor. Oh, we got we got some some people that are screaming in the background. <laughs> some initial fans back there, I guess. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, let's go fa save Jason. I hope everything's OK on his side. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so me. much. And congratulations, Christina. Thank you. See ya. Fantastic. All right. Next up, we have Chris Anthony from Gallery Media Group. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Hi, Andre. How are you? Good. You're always bringing up the the power on the on the the tail end of the show. Thanks for joining. No All right, we get, we have a great conversation to round things out. So we've got Patrick O'Keefe who joins us from Elf Beauty. And Patrick, what don't you do is all I'm going to ask. <laughs> I mean, this list of everything from paid media, social media, influencer marketing, PR, and it's not just for one brand, but the full portfolio at Elf. I'm exhausted yes. just even talking about it. <laughs> well, it's good to see you. Nice to see you. I'll let you guys take it away. All right. Thanks, Andrea. Patrick, so good to see you. Likewise. How are you, Chris? 
I'm good. I'm excited for this. Huge, obviously, fan of the brand and all the work you guys do. So I'm excited we're ending the show with some good insights from you. Love it. Um, the topic today is brand performance. How do you, as like an organization, just think about branding and performance overall from a philosophy standpoint? We love our community. Everything we do is centered around our community. We listen, we learn, we are a brand of the people, by the people, and for the people. So at the end of every day, we read all of our comments. Our CMO, Corey Marchesoto, is in there all the time, and we are connecting based on what we're, we're seeing, and we're reviewing it and making action against it. I love it. The power of comments on social is, is pretty wild and so amazing that you guys use that to inform so much of the work. Um, there's so much fun stuff to get through um, with what you guys are doing. But one thing I think comes to mind is, you know, how do you guys think about culture and talent and creators? You have so many, I think, examples of wins. I mean, Jennifer Coolidge, I feel like you guys really struck gold um, with that partnership. But talk a little bit about just creators and talent and culture and what has that done in terms of building the brand? It, they have to be authentic to the brand first. They have to love it first. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, if we, if we think about what we did with Jennifer Coolidge, um, mm -hmm. she loved the brand. Her social person was using the product and Jennifer asked him what the product was. And she's like, let's play with it. Let's try it. She tried it. She loved it. And that was the start of that beautiful relationship. And then of course her access Hollywood <laughs> cameo when the, when the reporter asked her, Hey, you know, what, what do you want your next role to be? And she said, I want to be a dolphin. And of course, dolphin skin was trending on TikTok. So connecting the dots really helped us propel that commercial and into our next campaign that we just launched recently with dirty pillows. She is an, uh, an incredible, incredible talent, and we are so grateful to have her as part of our family as we continue to build um, the brand. And what I love even more is the comments that people, our community, going back to the community, what they say is they, we, we love her. Anything she puts out there, we will buy. <laughs> and it's truly what they say. And then the other comments they make is this is what marketing should be. This is what advertising should be. People having fun in this space, just having leaning into a cultural moment and finding your way in. I love that. And I think to your point, so many people in our industry talk about authenticity and it can just be a word we throw around, but I feel like the way you just described that partnership is just definitely the definition of that. So congrats. I love that is continuing the work and, see, and watching that journey go on. Um, we talked a lot about platforms today and obviously they're a big core of how you guys talk to your community. I think of Elf as really sort of writing the playbook for tech TikTok. I think you guys were really early on on that platform and um, got tons of press and were really looked at as a thought leader in this space. And I think so many people then started taking cues and building off that success. How do you guys think about TikTok continually, you know, in the world today we're in? What do you think is next of using that platform? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, I love that question. I, TikTok obviously is, is there's a lot of, there are a lot, many platforms. That's I want to say that too, because I think they're all equally important. They all serve a different purpose with TikTok specifically, you know, the eyes, lips, face song early on in our journey was really what propelled us into the billion, what we call the billionaires club mm -hmm. from a views perspective. We did a partnership with gamers got talent as we entered mm -hmm. into the gaming space, gener generated a lot more, a billion, a billion more views for us. And I, and I love our new collaboration that right now we did with Manuel Teresa as we're leaning in um, into a community that really is about empowering women. Mm -hmm. And Manuel, we just created another Ojos Labos Cara, Cara song, Eyes, Lips, Face mm -hmm. in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And what's super cool about that, that partnership is that, you know, TikTok was another place that we're leaning in to help expand. It's finding new audiences. It's leaning in where you find the right trend or the right comment that could trigger something. Mm -hmm. We have an insights team and every week we sit down and we sit around a table and we talk about what we're learning. Mm -hmm. And then if we see something, we say something and then we do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful for companies that really take action when you are listening to a community of people that really help to shape culture. Yeah, and, it, and to your point, just the insights are so powerful and the fact that you guys are putting those in practice is, is really important and, and really commendable. In the vein of, of brand, you know, standing for something, I think is, you know, obviously so important, especially in, you know, the, the younger generation and, and really every generation, especially in the world we are in today. Talk a little about purpose. What, what does purpose mean for the brand and to Elf and to you? Wow, it's everything. <laughs> we, we, we always, we have a framework in which we really lean into. It's we are bold disruptors with a kind heart. We disrupt norms, we shape culture, and we connect communities. 
That is a framework that we lean into every project that we do or every campaign. Anytime we sit in a room, we always ask the question. It always has to lean back, come back to a, a sense of purpose. When I think about, you know, we're one of only four out of 4,200 publicly traded companies that have two thirds women and, and one third diverse, that is mm -hmm. an incredible thing to, to put out there. And it makes me so proud to be part of a company that really mm -hmm. honors and celebrates women and diversity and a more, and, and they put action behind it. Mm -hmm. I also, when I think about what we did with Billie Jean King, I mean, it, she is really um, a, a true testament about mm -hmm. something that she stood for and she believed around equal pay for equal play, what she did with Battle of the Sexes. And it, it was really an honor to sit, to meet her A and to be a, for her to be a part of really helping to shape what we're trying to do to really empower young women in the, in, in the world of sports. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, it's just constantly, you guys keep on, you know, spotting new interesting collaborations. It continually just gets better and better. You talked about this really quickly. Um, you know, when we talk about the platform space, TikTok, um, and you mentioned gaming a little bit, that seems to be, you know, a space that's continually, you know, helping reach new audiences, different types of engagements. Talk a little about that overall as a category for you guys. Yeah, I, I, I love it. And it's it's just, it, it, we, we started a channel on Twitch. It's called mm -hmm. LQ. Um, what we learned is that, that a lot of, excuse me, women were being bullied on the platform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were like, well, that's, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah. We're a brand of really celebrating and empowering women and they're getting, you know, abused on the channel. So we, we partnered with Loser Fruit, who's the number two women gamer in, in this space. And she's based out of Australia who, and she is so elf and she's got a, she is a mm -hmm. bold disruptor with a kind heart for sure. Mm -hmm. And we created a channel called Elf U and it's basically about, you know, celebrating women, giving women a safe space, giving them a place to really do makeup, hang out, and just really connect in a, on a deeper level and, and really mm -hmm. celebrate, you know, what they'd love to do, which is gaming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it, it definitely tracks back to your whole point around, you know, being authentic and purpose driven, but doing it in a space that, you know, is interesting at the same time. So, so great. Um, what last question really for you, and I think you touched upon this a little bit in some of the other parts, but another thing I think you guys are continually known for is just is collaborations that some of the things you guys have done with other brands that have been super disruptive. What have you learned from there? Um, that's I think going to continually take you guys into next year with exciting, um, continuations on that front. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it, it, listen, it all, it's, it's all about connecting dots and, we, we, like I said, we read the comments, we see something and then we say something and then we do something and we lean in mm -hmm. and it's about an insight. If I think about Megan Trainer, the weather channel, why would we do something with Megan Trainer? Eight out of 10 women change their beauty behavior because of, because of the weather. Wow. That's a powerful insight. Mm -hmm. She was also trending on TikTok. So again, connecting the dots, she wanted to be a weather woman. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> Hi. It was like the perfect storm. And so, of course, for us, we wanted to really find a way that made sense, that's authentic, that creates a little bit of, of humor and and have some fun along the way. And she she did a, an amazing job of really finding a way to really take our one of our products and make it another uh, another really big, big brand on TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. So, so much great work that you guys continue to do. Congratulations. Um, on everything. And I can't wait to see what happens in 24, which is around the corner. I'm sure there'll be a million other exciting things to talk to you guys about um, and for you guys to share with the world. So congrats. Oh, there's more coming. For yeah. sure. <laughs> I, I'm sure. Thanks, um, Chris. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank All you right. so much um, for joining us today. Thanks, you guys, for closing us out. Thank you. We got another episode that's upcoming uh, in just, I think it's like 13 days. Uh, we're going to be focusing on how we unlock a growth mindset. And we've got some exciting brands uh, that include Stuart Weitzman, WNBA, Vans, Crayola, H&R Block, Sanofi. And we have one other mystery brand that's coming soon. So we hope to see you very, very soon on that episode. And until then, please take care of yourselves. Thanks so much for joining Marketing for the Now.